Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. We started talking last week about the book of Revelation. There are people who seem to be out all over the airwaves telling us that we're seeing the fulfillment of the book of Revelation all around us, and that this should lead us to follow them in their various schemes and things like this. We've got Glenn Beck telling us that everything happening in the newspaper is lining up with the book of Revelation. We've got Rod Arquette saying similar things on the radio. We've got uh, Harold Camping going in a different direction, but now he has billboards here in Salt Lake telling us 38 more days until the end of the world. The Bible guarantees it. Um, Harold doesn't actually get too much into the book of Revelation as he does a lot of numerology and a lot of other weird speculation. But the book of Revelation is something that there is more confusion about than, than clarity. And so with some reluctance, I started last week trying to give an introduction to the context for the book of Revelation. And I want to continue that this week. And then we're going to go through basically a survey of the book to give you a handle that it's not something that is indecipherable. It's not some weird uh, book that has to be interpreted, something like the book of, uh, you know, the various writings of Nostradamus or some other false prophets out there that they have all these strange images that can't be interpreted. What I started with last week was to tell you that it is part of the Bible. And there are 65 preceding books that give us a context for what we see there. And if we take that context, there may be some uh, lack of clarity in terms of some of the specifics of some uh, various details, but the, but the main thrust of it is very clear. And it is something, it is a book of the Bible that has been abused by so many people. Uh, we have a host of so-called self-proclaimed self Bible teachers out there who play connect the dots between all kinds of various passages taken out of context, including the book of Revelation, and they give you their scheme of something you would never find if you actually read the Bible for yourself. And they promote themselves and people flock to them. But I, I challenge you to do something unusual. Read the Bible for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anyone else's word for it. Let Scripture interpret Scripture and read it as if it is what it claims to be, the Word of God. And it has to be understood. It has to be taken seriously. You don't just pick random verses and think that somehow God's going to speak to you in some mystical, magical way. It is a story. It is written over the course of one and a half millennia. It is a history. It is the unfolding drama of God's redemption. It tells us about the creation of man, about his rebellion and fall, and the undoing of that fall that takes up all the rest of Scripture from Genesis 3 with the bruising of uh, or the promise of the seed of the woman who's going to bruise the head of the serpent until Revelation 22. It's one story. It's one epic. But most people don't want to read the Bible for themselves. They want a priest or a prophet or somebody to, to, to read it for them or not even to bother with this, but get something new. 
our forefathers paid with their lives to have this book. It was a death sentence throughout much of Europe for hundreds of years to have this book. And yet, what it typically does today is sits on the shelf and gathers dust. The book of Revelation is in the context of the rest of Scripture. And if you, if you know what Scripture says, it will make sense. Now, last week we went through a survey of the Old Testament in terms of God's covenant with Israel. Because to take all the surprise out of it, we're not going to have some, some dramatic climax. I believe that most of the book of Revelation is dealing with the same subject that Jesus is dealing with in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. It's, the, it's John's version of the Olivet Discourse. It is about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now there's more, to, to, there's more than just that in there, and it deals with the aftermath of that destruction and, the, and Christ reigning and Satan being bound and, and the Gospel going out to the nations. There's more to Revelation than just that. But when we recognize that Revelation is a letter, it's not a letter to, to, to metaphorical groups out there. The seven churches to, to which it is addressed are not uh, abstract uh, signs of something other than real people. Just like Paul writes a letter to the Galatians and the Romans and the Philippians and the Colossians and the various other ones, a real letter to real people, John is writing a real letter to real churches that really existed. But what people do is because of the imagery and with often a, a lack of understanding of that imagery from the Old Testament, they presume this isn't written to real churches. But these are, these at least have some deeper spiritual meaning. From, from Joachim of Fjord over a thousand years ago, we have people saying that the seven churches are not really churches, but seven church ages. And they're supposed to, to, to lay out this, this scheme of, of Christian history that will uh, reach its final point in the Laodicean church age and all this. This is foolishness. This is a real letter to real people, and when they read it, it was supposed to be a revelation, an, un, an unveiling, an, an uncovering. It wasn't like in Ezekiel where the prophecy is sealed up. It is not to be sealed up. It is a revelation. But most people don't know their scriptures like we described last week. Well, we went through a survey and I was trying to show you the point that God's covenant with the physical seed of Abraham is a conditional covenant. does not mean that he has ever totally cast away his people. It doesn't mean he's through dealing with the physical seed of Abraham. On the contrary, Romans 11 makes very clear that, that even though the natural branches have been broken off for unbelief, God is able to graft them in once more. There is no biblical basis for seeing Jews as inferior or uh, under some kind of uh, special judgment. They are, um, they are still God's covenant people in the sense that God deals with that physical seed. But what so many people today don't understand is that just being of the physical seed of Abraham doesn't make you right with God, and it never has and it never will. Jesus tells the unbelieving Pharisees that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. No one honors the Father if they do not honor the Son. Now last week that led to me being called a Nazi. We had a caller who said that he had family members who were Christians uh, that are of uh, Jewish uh, ancestry, 
but he had others who were faithfully following the Old Testament. Jesus says that's not possible. If you don't have the Son, you cannot have the Father. You cannot, there is no Old Testament Judaism that can be practiced anymore because God has taken away the tabernacle and temple. There is no more temple. There is no more sacrifice. There is no more high priest. There is no, none of the things that were central to Old Testament Judaism. When Christ came, he fulfilled those things and they were taken away because their continued practice was a denial of Christ's sacrifice. They were a denial of his priesthood. They were a denial of the new temple that he was building in the church. And so, when we recognize that, when we recognize that this is a conditional covenant, that election is al has always been unconditional. But as we saw last week with Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 29 and 30, all through the Old Testament, God makes clear, if you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will curse you. I will bring the curses of the covenant upon you. And he tells them, I, I call heaven and earth to witness that I have set before you blessing and cursing, life and death. Choose life. Unfortunately, the history of Israel through the Old Testament is one of God blessing them. They get fat and happy. They, they forget God. And God ends up having to bring judgments on them and give them over to their enemies and eventually brings repentance and restoration and blessing once more. But unfortunately, that cycle just keeps repeating itself over and over. Uh, you can look through Hosea, Ezekiel 16, a host of places in Scripture. What you find is the harlot is not something new in Revelation. It is unbelieving Israel. They are, were supposed to be the faithful bride. And yet, by and large, the physical seed of Abraham were unfaithful. Now, it's not because they were uh, worse than us. Any failure of any Jew is a failure of the human race. But there is no, there is no blessing apart from Christ. There is no, there is no forgiveness except through Him. So we dealt with that. We dealt with the 70 weeks of Daniel. We dealt with, um, in Daniel 9, the, that we don't have this 2,000 year gap, but rather, just like God promised, that time was going to end in the destruction of Jerusalem, just like it had in 586 B.C. The land was going to enjoy her Sabbath once more because God was going to destroy Jerusalem. So many people today, when they read this about the, the people of the prince who is to come, they try to make it into the Antichrist. And yet what we saw last week is it's Christ. It is, Christ, it is God who destroyed Jerusalem in 586, just like he destroyed Tyre and Sidon, just like he brought the plagues on Egypt, just like he de destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, how he destroyed Nineveh and Babylon, and you go down the list. Habakkuk makes very clear that it is God who brings the Babylonians to come and destroy Jerusalem. When you understand that, which is unfortunately a revelation for many 21st century Americans, that God would actually destroy Jerusalem then all of a sudden the Olivet Discourse in the book of Revelation makes a whole lot more sense. Well, we went through a great deal of this last week. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but when you come to the end of the Old Testament, many of us are familiar with the promises in Malachi about the coming of the Messiah and about the ministry of John the Baptist. There are verses that we often have in our memory because we've heard them so often, but very rarely do we hear the full context. In Malachi 3, verses 1 through 3, we have the promise there of John the Baptist preparing the way before Christ. 
It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. But then what we don't typically hear is the rest. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. We have this delusion that is totally contrary to, the, to God's word, that God is only going to bring blessings to the physical seed of Abraham. And that the book of Revelation, it, it can't be about God's judgment of Jerusalem. God, God says, I'll bless those who bless thee and curse those who curse thee. Well, what about when God curses Israel? As we saw last week, he does it over and over. He never, th he never cast them away, but like Romans 9 tells us, he's preserved a remnant for himself. But they are not to presume. And so many times you'll hear these people talking about prophecy that, that they, the prophets see Jesus coming in wrath, but they don't see him coming in mercy first and this and that and the other. Because they're inserting things into the text that don't belong. And they're ignoring the fact that when Jesus said, this generation shall not pass away until not one stone is left on, uh, on another, until Jerusalem is destroyed, and that that generation did not pass away. Forty years after Jesus said it, 1.1 million Jews were slaughtered. And Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was taken away not to be rebuilt. But so many, so many people who put themselves forward as teachers, they say, oh, no, 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 that's not really what's in focus here. Maybe there's a few verses here and there that refer to that. But no, we have to, we have to jump forward 2,000 years. We have to get, go through this church age, which supposedly the, the, the Old Testament knew nothing about, um, which is a farce. But we have to rebuild and redestroy the temple. No, it was destroyed in that generation. When we understand this context, when we come to Revelation, a whole lot of things will make sense. The very next chapter in Malachi, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. But most people don't read on. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. These are the last words of the last prophet of the Old Testament. A warning to Israel that the Messiah is coming with a promise just like God had put, set before Israel before. Life and death, blessing and cursing. And John the Baptist, when he comes in fulfillment of these promises, you remember Jesus says that if, if you will hear it, this is, he is Elijah not in some strange New Age kind of fanciful way, but he comes in the spirit of Elijah. He fulfills that, that ministry, and he prepares the way before Jesus. But what was the preaching of John the Baptist? He sets before Israel life and death, blessing and cursing. In Matthew 3, verses 7 and following, referring there to John the Baptist, it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism. He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. 
I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Do you recognize that when Jesus comes, he doesn't simply come offering forgiveness. He does offer forgiveness, and that is wonderful news, but he also makes clear that he has come to bring division. He makes clear that there are still the godly and the ungodly. And just like John the Baptist predicted, he is going to bring judgment upon a generation of vipers. Over and over, we see Jesus threatening judgment. But most people don't read their Bibles anymore. They think Jesus only comes to bring uh, good news. But Jesus talked more of judgment and hell than anyone in all of Scripture. In Matthew 8, you have there the story I alluded to last week. Jesus has some of the Jews come to him and ask him to come and heal the servant of this Roman centurion. And they tell that the centurion has done great service for the Jews. He has built them a synagogue there in Capernaum. And um, would he please come and, and, and heal this man's servant? So Jesus begins to go. The centurion hears. And he sends word to Jesus, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Simply speak the word. I'm a man under authority. I say do this and it's done. Simply speak the word. And I know that it will be done. And Jesus says... Uh, in verses uh, 10 through 12. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and s shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is warning these Jews who are presuming, we have Abraham as our father, we have the law, we have the temple, we have the ordinances, we have all these things. And he's telling them that it's going to be, to a great extent, Gentiles like this. You remember the, the, the Canaanite woman, the Syrophoenician woman is, is translated in some places. The Canaanite woman comes to Jesus she has a demon-possessed daughter. She pleads with him. He ignores her. The disciples want him to send her away. And he tells, he tells her, I wasn't sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she persists. And Jesus says, is it, is it fitting? It's not fitting to take the children's bread and cast it to the little dogs. The woman doesn't get offended. She doesn't say, how dare you speak to me that way? How dare you, you allude to me being a Gentile dog like some Pharisee would? She says, truth, Lord. But even the do little dogs eat from the, crumb, the, from the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Jesus commends her faith. Many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom, but the, the children... The sons of the kingdom, they're going to be cast into outer darkness. There is a harvest amongst the Jews at Pentecost and afterwards, and there continues to be. In my reading of Scripture, I believe that there's an even greater harvest ahead. That being said, what happens when they no longer are simply killing the prophets, but they kill the Son of God. Jesus 
in Matthew 11, verse 20 and following, it says there, Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Do you understand my frustration when I hear people like John Hagee saying that we should never say that Jews might not be right with God and that they need to come through Jesus. Pat Robertson says Jews don't have to come through Jesus because they're God's chosen people. Now the reality is Jew or Gentile, we are all sinners who deserve hell. And the only hope any of us have is Christ. The reason that so many uh, Jews were blinded and uh, so many Gentiles had their eyes open is not because we're smarter, better looking, not because of anything in us, but because God had mercy. That's the point of Romans 9. It's God who has mercy. And he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And whom he wills, he hardens. I'm going to open up the phone lines. But I, my hope is that as you understand this context of the judgment that is, that is executed on Israel all through the Old Testament, God gives them over to the Midianites, to the Philistines, to the, uh, to the Assyrians, to the Babylonians, etc., etc., when you see this judgment pattern, that this covenant is conditional, you have the visible and the invisible church in the Old Testament. The invisible church is always unconditional. The, the invisible church is in Christ. Abraham was not saved because he was, was good or, or uh, anything uh, superior to the people around him. He's shown warts and all in the Old Testament. But by grace, he was given faith. And through that faith, he was justified. And the Holy Spirit sanctified him and turned him from a man who was willing to, to have his wife violated to the man who was willing to sacrifice his son. We see in Scripture that we are all sinners. But it is unfortunately unusual for anyone to talk about the judgments of God and the wrath of God in these respects. And if you don't understand that, you will not understand Revelation. The phone number here is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820 if you'd like to join in the conversation. Do you believe these things or do you want to join in the chorus of last week that I'm simply a Nazi and anti-Semite and I'm hating people and that I'm just picking and choosing what I'm saying out of the scripture? I think that if you read from cover to cover, you'll see that this is throughout scripture. It's only when you pick and choose and ignore large portions that you can avoid this. It shows us the holiness of God. It shows us the seriousness of sin for all of us. It also shows us that the love of God in Jesus Christ is greater than most people ever begin to dream of because he didn't die to help good people save themselves. He died for his enemies. I raised the question We saw at the end of 2 Chronicles 36 last week how God had mercy and he sent prophets over and over and yet they wouldn't hear them and they killed them. 
what happens when he sends his son? In Matthew 21, beginning at verse 33, Jesus gives a parable that, that outlines what is going to happen to him. He says, hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did unto him them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spoke of them. When God tells them, if you will obey my voice, if you will hear me and keep my commandments, this is how I'm going to bless you. I'm going to, I'm going to make it so that one of you will, will chase a dozen of your enemies, and a dozen of you will chase a hundred or a thousand. He gives them these graphic illustrations of, of how he's going to bless them. He's going to make their enemies fearful. He's going to, to bring a, a fruitfulness in the land. He's going to, to bring fruitfulness in their homes. They are going to be blessed in unimaginable ways if they will obey him, but if they will not obey him then he sets before them curses. And as we saw last week, he says, I'll give you into your enemy's hands. He says, you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you shall eat. He makes very clear what he is going to bring upon them if they, if they rebel. What happens when they no longer are killing prophets, but when they kill the son? What happens when they say, as they do in, in Matthew's gospel, crucify him. And Pilate says that he washes his hands of the blood of this innocent man. And they say, let his blood be on us and on our children. What happens? Jesus doesn't leave us to wonder. He says, the kingdom will be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Most of the people in, in our audience are not of the physical seed of Abraham. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're a true believer, you are, um, you're grafted in as a wild olive branch. Um, Rom, uh, Romans chapter 11. And we're told that just like in the Old Testament, the visible church is a conditional covenant. That if God spared not the natural branches, He may not spare us either. You look at, you look at where Christianity has flourished in times past. It's uh, North Africa is a wasteland. Uh, Turkey, most of, most of it gave up to Islam years ago and at the beginning of the 20th century, the Turks just slaughtered. Uh, over a million of the Armenians just slaughtered them. Did you know that the, the professing Christian population of Turkey uh, at the beginning of the 20th century was 20%? They were killed or driven into exile. 
it is, um, it's sad to see what's becoming of America. But God is not, God is not idle. We may forsake the faith of our fathers and, and reject the covenant and bring curses upon ourselves, but the gospel continues to go out all around the world. Uh, we'll continue to look at this, but we're going to go ahead and take our first call. We have George from Kaysville with us. George, good to have you with us this evening. Hello. Uh, this is George from Kaysville. You're on the air. Is that, uh, is that Pastor there? Yes. Okay, I would like to ask you um, a couple of questions. Do you think that all uh, Jewish you know, synagogues and Jewish rabbis, thousands of them, you know, here in the U.S. and around the world, that they are actually, uh, actually teaching their people everything false? And the second question is, <clears throat> could you invite one of the rabbis to be on your show that this way that he can uh, explain his side of the story sure. you know, with yours? Okay. All right. Thank you for your call. Um, in answer to the first question, um, yes. I believe that every Buddhist monk is teaching their people in error. I believe that every um, Muslim imam who says that Jesus was merely a prophet and not the Son of God, he was not crucified, um, I think that they're teaching their people in error. I think that every rabbi who uh, is holding to um, Reformed or conservative or Orthodox Judaism, uh, they, they are in error. Uh, I think that they are seeking to establish their own righteousness and not submitting to the righteousness of Christ. Paul confesses that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Um, and Jesus makes clear, you, can, you cannot honor the Father unless you honor the Son. You, 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 you cannot come to the Father except through the Son. If, if, you, if, if you can be right with God through Judaism, rejecting Jesus Christ, and, and, and through prayer, through reading the Bible, through uh, the Old Testament or things like this, if you can be right with God, there was absolutely no purpose in Christ coming in the first place. And when Jesus was agonizing in the garden, sweating drops of blood, and, and, and saying, Father, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. Then I guess he just overlooked that one. If there's some other way. But the reality is, Jesus says there is no other way. And when you reject Christ... You reject the Father. Jesus says to the unbelieving Jews, he says, uh, you know, they say, we have Abraham to our father. And the conversation goes forward. And finally they say, you know, we weren't born of fornication, indicating Jesus was. We have even one as our father, God. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, if God were your father, you would believe me. But you are of your father, the devil. So, no, um, if, if anyone can go to heaven except through Jesus Christ, there was absolutely no purpose in him coming. Um, it's funny what happens when there's actually truth in the world. Remember, remember Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? The world doesn't like truth. Jesus says, I am the way the truth and the life. He is the truth. And it's when we try to be politically correct and make, and make brownie points with people and make God seem not really all that, that um, narrow and bigoted and judgmental, all those things that the world seems to hate. That's the way they would describe it. You know, the God of the Bible is holy. 
God of the Bible drowns the whole world. The God of the Bible, when Nadab and Abihu offer worship that is contrary to what he prescribed, he doesn't say, I appreciate you being inventive and, and, and using your creativity to honor me. Fire of the Lord goes out and consumes them. They become the incense. And it's Jesus himself that those who receive the mark in Revelation 14 is those uh, they're tormented in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Hell's not the absence of God. It's the presence of God and His wrath. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Um, my father years ago was invited to a uh, get-together. And it was... Um, I think it was a, a Reformed uh, Jewish synagogue. They were having this big get-together. and A uh, local merchant who was Jewish knew my father, knew that he knew a lot of the folks from growing up in Savannah. And so he asked him if he wanted to come along. And here's my father, a South Georgia redneck, wearing a yarmulke in a Jewish uh, synagogue, the Fellowship Hall, whatever you would call that. And they're having this meal there. Uh, it's reformed, so it wasn't very strict by any stretch. But um, some people ask, and they said, Mr. Wallace, you know, we're concerned for relations between Jews and, and Christians. Uh, what, what do you see as the major differences between us? And you'd have to know my father. He's passed away now. But he said, well, honestly, really not that much. He said, we think a great deal of Moses and um, David and the prophets. He said, honestly, the only real difference that I see between us is that we believe them when they told us that Jesus was coming. Anyway, we will go to our next call, Jim from American Fork. Jim, good to have you with us this evening. Thank you. Um, I'm a born-again Christian, and I believe in the literal, the Bible is the literal Word of God. So that's good. where my, I'm coming from. And I'm not going to, um, I, I, again, I want to be very brief with it. Uh, it so I'm going to reference a couple of blocks of uh, Scripture uh, in the Bible. If you look at Ezekiel 47 and 48. Okay. If you look, don't don't do that right now. You, I'm okay. sure you're familiar enough with it. I'm just going to talk about a couple of things in it. And Zechariah 12 through 14. Mm hmm And uh, Revelation in general. Uh, in the when Jesus left, the angel said, "Why are you looking up? He's going to return the same way." And when he does however, explains in those scriptures that Mount Moriah is going to split in two and move to the north and to the south, making a valley that the remnant of the Jewish people can escape to what is Petra. Now, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the 144,000. Jim, Jim, you're jumping ahead. From each of the 12 tribes. Jim, you're jumping hey, ahead. Pardon? Let's let's keep our focus no, on no, what's in front saying, of us I'm here. Talking, you're talking about being done with Jew, Jewish, and I'm saying I had never in, in, in Zechariah, I believe it says there will be uh, two thirds of the Jewish remnant will be, or two, uh, the Jewish people will be killed, and but one third will survive. And it also says in Zechariah that every year. All the nations of the, the world will come to Jerusalem to pay homage to which will be the millennial kingdom. The Lord is there. And if they don't do that, they don't get rain. All right, Jim. And it, Jim. Yes. Do you believe that God destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D.? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you believe that, as we went through last week, that 
my that that I a Gentile am a son of Abraham that I am the circumcision Philippians 3 that uh, I am that Ephesians 2 I I was a stranger uh, to the covenant uh, to the, uh, stranger from the Commonwealth of Israel alien stranger and an alien uh, far from the promises but through Christ I've been brought near and that I am now grafted in and that I am as a Christian part of the real Israel along with Abraham Isaac and Jacob and a host of modern believers of Jewish descent who also have come through Christ. Do you believe that, or do you reject that? Because that's... I believe that, but I also, okay. which tribe are you from, from the 12 Jewish tribes? I have, like I said, I'm of Gentile descent, but through faith I am, I am part of oh, okay. Israel. When you read those scriptures that I talked about, Zechariah and Ezekiel, it very, very clearly outlines the strips of land and named Jim. cities in Israel, Jim. and they go clear to the borders with Iraq and, and Jim. Syria and so on. And it, it says Jim. which tribes will be where. You who, Jim. Israel is very Jim in the millennial kingdom. Sorry, Jim. Um, I, I tried to give him ample opportunity. This is, this is the great frustration. We will deal with, with these things as we come to them. But what I'm trying to lay out is the conditional nature of the covenant, the wrath of God against unbelieving Israel in the Old Testament and in the New, and how this is a constant motif through the New Testament. It is in the, in the wicked husbandman, but Jim doesn't deal with that. Jim wants to take us to Zechariah and these other things and not focus on this. That's what I was trying to ask him. Uh, I, don't, I, I hope he just was having difficulty hearing me and wasn't ignoring me and just going off there. But um, what we see in the scriptures is that Jesus constantly held out this threat that if the Jews pursue this, that the wrath of God was going to come on them. We're going to look at a few of these real quick. We'll try to squeeze in some more calls in a moment here. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 7. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Over and over, Jesus promises destruction on Jerusalem. When he enters Jerusalem in Luke's gospel, he weeps over the city. We won't go through the, uh, the passages, but he says that they're going, to, they're going to throw up a ramp against her. They're going to lay her level with the ground. They're going to destroy her. When the women are weeping as he's taking his cross to Calvary, he tells the women, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves. Because the days are coming when they'll say, blessed is the womb that never bore and the, and the, and the breast that never gave suck. Over and over we see this promise of judgment. He says, you know, to what shall I liken this generation? They're like um, children in the marketplace. You know, we piped to you and you haven't danced. We've, we've mourned to you and you haven't lamented. And then he gives them the parable about this fig tree and it's not bearing. And we see that this is an image. You'll hear this often in prophecy things about how, you know, the fig tree is going to bud and this and that and the other. What is a symbol of Israel? Joel, Hosea, use it as a picture of Israel. The fig tree's not bearing. 
And he says, why does it cumber the ground? Cut it down. He says, no, no, Lord, but please, you know, we're going to, we'll, we'll, we'll dung it about, we'll fertilize it, we'll, we'll provide for it, and then if it doesn't bear, then, then we'll cut it down. You remember when Jesus comes to, to Jerusalem in that last week, he sees the fig leaf and there's no fruit. He curses it and it withers. And you read Matthew 23 and you see all the woes. I won't go through all of them. We'll try to squeeze in some calls here. But he says, you say to yourselves, if we lived in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. But you bear testimony against yourselves that you are the sons of those who killed the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from righteous Abel to Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you killed between the altar and the temple. He says that that generation, all that blood is going to come on that generation. And it did. And that leads immediately into 24 in the whole of that discourse. Over and over you see this judgment. It is a conditional covenant and there are curses as well as blessings. And to ignore those curses is to ignore most of Scripture. We'll try to squeeze in some quick calls here. We have Mike from Draper. Mike, good to have you with us. We're running short on time. Okay, thanks for uh, taking my call. I guess sure. my question would be on the mark of the beast. Uh, how would like people who the book Revelation was actually uh, written to, how would they have taken that? And is there any application, I guess, for us nowadays? And sure. then if there's any time, how does like a regular schmo, I've been like a Christian for about three years, how does a regular schmo like read the book of <laughs> Revelation kind of for all it's worth? Is it just something you just have to Good read question. the Bible for years and years to kind of get it or just do that and I'll hang up and okay. answer? Thank you. Hey, appreciate the call. Wonderful question. This is what I need to end on anyway. Um, we have Ray from Syracuse holding. We'll, we'll get to you after the, the show, Ray. Um, how would they have read it? When you go to the first part of Revelation, it doesn't have all this, this strange imagery that you see later on. It's very forthright. It's very straightforward. I think what they would have understood, the church was being persecuted. You look through the book of Acts. Who is it that was driving the persecution of the church up until 64 AD when Nero blames Christians for burning Rome? It's the Jews. They're the ones who follow Paul to all these cities and, and have, stir up the people to stone him and leave him for dead. And what is, what is shown in Revelation is that Jesus is coming in judgment and deliverance. What you see in Revelation destroys all this pessimism. People think that, that you know, when... when uh, when Franklin Graham was asked, where was God when Hurricane Katrina hit? He said, God had nothing to do with Hurricane Katrina. Satan's the God of this world. They really think that, that we're sitting here with Satan ruling this world. And we have some people saying, you know, God has no hands but ours and all this other stuff. Jesus said when he was about to ascend, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. When you read Revelation and when you start to compare it to Zechariah, Zechariah is dealing with the rebuilding of the temple after the return from exile. The point that's being made there is par purposely paralleling Zechariah because in spite of all the opposition, that temple was going to be rebuilt. And in Revelation in spite of all the opposition, in spite of all the persecution, in spite of the fact that the Roman Empire itself is going to now come against them, Christ is going to build his temple in spite of them all. We have people who have this idea that the church must end in failure. We must be in the Laodicean church age and all this stuff. It's not found in scripture. Dispensationalism came about in the 19th century along with a whole lot of other goofiness. Jesus is reigning at the right hand of his Father until all his enemies are made his footstool. Psalm 110, it's quoted over and over in the New Testament. Psalm 2, the second of the two uh, Psalms most quoted in all of the New Testament. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. 
I will declare the decree the, the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the nations for thine inheritance. People used to have optimism that Christ is reigning and Christ wins. But people have this idea now that, Christ, that the church is just going to lose and, and, and Christ is wringing his hands and, and, and the, the ungodly are in charge. No. Now the reality is there are a whole bunch of ungodly people. We're not trying to save the world. We're not trying to, to create heaven here on earth. But Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of power and he is ruling and reigning and all his enemies will be made his footstool. We've gone from an upper room with a bunch of uh, frightened, with a handful of frightened saints to where a third of the world gives lip service at least to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And we've abandoned that faith of our fathers, that, that optimism. The revelation is the revelation that Jesus is Lord and he will conquer and he will win. And the battle of Armageddon, there's no battle of Armageddon in, in Revelation. They gather for the battle, but when you, get to, when you get to, after they all get gathered there, the next thing you see is they're all dead. <laughs> they're destroyed because Christ wins. Well, we've run out of time, but um, we'll be picking this up, Lord willing, next week. We are sponsored by Christ Presbyterian Church. We are a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian denomination. We meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m., Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South. Like Jim, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. It is our only infallible rule of faith and practice. We believe it is inerrant and infallible. Unfortunately, we see people interpreting it in very strange ways often. We have a sister congregation, Berean Presbyterian Church in Ogden. They meet at 3350 Harrison Boulevard, 9 a.m. Sunday mornings. And we're soon going to be having a meeting in Heber. Uh, there's a group of folks who want to see a Bible study up there. If you know of anyone who might be interested in that area, please give us a call or let them uh, know that we're trying to do something. And also we have an outreach in Utah County as well. You can go to our website at ChristPres.net or give us a call at 801-969-7948. Till next time, we wish you the Lord's blessings. Good night.